are considering the six uh, points of Kant, what I like to call Kant in six easy lessons. We are at uh, lesson number three, which we call the sausage grinder. of a sausage grinder. I've never seen a sausage grinder in my life, Nicole, so this is sort of what I envision. This is kind of a big unit, <laughs> not to be confused, of course, with the big unit, who is who, baseball big unit. Uh, oh my goodness. No, come on. Pitch for the Mariners, the big unit. What's his name? Well, yeah, you're a pitcher. You're supposed to have this dog bang like that. All right. I always did think, though, if I were standing at the, at the batter's box and Randy Johnson were on the mound, his sheer ugliness would scare me away. I mean, he just, the guy is so scary looking. <laughs> I mean, really. You got, see, see, I know it. I know it. That, Spencer, is the biggest problem you've got. You're a great pitcher, fast, hard, but you're just too good looking. <laughs> People stand out there, they go, oh, it's just Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get a Randy Johnson mask. <laughs> All right, so. So uh, there are several sub-points in our analysis of the sausage grinder. You want to understand each of these well. So the first sub-point is what we'll call the nozzles. <laughs> now by nozzles, I mean the nozzles in which you put stuff. So what I envision. I mean, unsophisticated butcher that I am. I don't know exactly how this is done, but I assume that you just stuff things in, you know? Bones, cartilage, stuff you sweep off the floor, sawdust, and maybe a little meat. I mean, who knows what goes into that sausage that you buy in the store. But anyway, uh, all kinds of stuff goes in. And for Kant, there are precisely two nozzles. Now remember, this entire device is the human mind. This is Kant's great innovation. This is his Copernican revolution. He's putting the mind at the center of his philosophical discussion. And so this entire conversation about a sausage grinder is his analysis of the machinery of the mind. And the first piece of that machinery is the nozzles, and these are called pure intuitions. Pure intuitions. The intuitions are part of your mind. They are not, to our knowledge, part of this external world. The stuff going in is, is coming from somewhere, we don't know where, but it comes in through these pure intuitions, and the pure intuitions are, one of them is space, and one of them is time. Not according to Kant. See, this is, this is one of the great uh, revolutionary ideas. Now, I'm not telling you, Avery, my opinion on this. I'm just advocating Kant's view. For Kant, he says 
we don't know if there is space or if there is time outside of the mind. We do know that considered objectively both space and time are fundamentally absurd as was shown by Zeno, Parmenides, and that whole tradition. You can apply a reductio ad absurdum to the objective ideas, but he also notes that the very operation of the mind depends on space and time. In other words, just do this little experiment. Try to imagine no space. Let's try that. Just try to imagine no space. How are you doing? The, the, the brain doesn't know what to do with that. No time. What Kant notices is that irrespective of how the external universe, if there is one, is organized, one thing is clear, the human mind intuitively applies spatial, temporal categories to its experience. We cannot think apart from space and apart from time. We don't know how to think that way. It is fundamental to thought. And so he calls these intuitions of the mind. We intuitively interpret all experiences in terms of space and in terms of mind. So please get, and Josiah, this is back to your comment. Or was it Stephen? Stephen, you made the comment. Who made the comment about? No, you made the comment. You, you made it, Avery. You're the genius. What's the comment? <laughs> <laughs> about thinking that space and time are objective. That was you. Okay. Yeah. I, it was such a bright comment. I thought it must have been Josiah. You see how that happens? It just, you know. <laughs> no, it's very good. It is. Notice the difference. Locke, Avery, would say that space and time are part of the external world. Locke would say we perceive space and time. I'm perceiving Laura, and I am perceiving her in space and I'm perceiving her in an ongoing flow of time. And Locke would say that's because out there somehow in the structure of the universe there is space and there is time and I'm perceiving it, I'm experiencing it. Kant puts it all inside the mind and says I don't know if there's space or not. My mind is, is applying that you know, interpretive scheme. All right, second component. This is not really a component of the meat grinder, but it is uh, necessary to understand its operation, is what Kant calls percepts. P-E-R-C-E-P-S, percepts. Percepts are precisely whatever it is that is flowing in through these nozzles. Raw, unfiltered, uninterpreted experience that is sensory. The fundamental senses that are activated are, as you well know, what you see, what you hear, what you taste. All of those senses of yours are being energized right now by 10,000 things, 100,000 things, a million things right now. If you could get narrow enough, you know, just subtle enough. If you could imagine, how many of you recall the movie Fantasia? Some years back, I think it was a Disney flick, wasn't it? And it was just sort of, what? What was it? Christy, you remember it? What was it uh, about? I don't know the exact storyline, but they had. There was of, not really. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> they had famous symphony music with the Disney characters and kind of just going along with the music, and there was a wizard and Mickey Mouse and this okay. animals. But, I mean, a lot of the movies I recall, it was just sort of just kind of flowing, wonderful colors, kind of, uh, but I got the right movie in mind, and, and a lot of it was not really sensible in the, in the sense that you were following a 
particular story with dramatic interaction between characters. It was just sort of these lights and sounds and colors and just this flowing kind of, and it was very pleasing. I don't know, I thought it was uh, kind of enjoyable. But here's what I want you to think about. There is a sense in which when a newborn infant comes into this world, that is the experience. It's just sounds and lights and whatever. There's no sense to it. There's no meaning. There's no rhyme. There's no reason. It's just this kind of collage, this almost blizzard of sensory experience. Imagine yourself being plunged into such a world. In other words, where Fantasia is not a movie, where it is the reality of your entire experience. You're just surrounded by, you know, kind of sounds and shapes and, you know, just imagine you're in that world. In that world, you are desperate to make some sense of what's going on. You're trying to figure out a handle you can grab onto. And Kant says that fundamentally is all the experience all of us have. We are plunged into a world of this collage of sensory experience of every description. And our mind goes to work trying to make sense of it, to put things into classes, categories, interpretive schemes. And the first thing we do is we start interpreting these experiences in terms of these most fundamental intuitions. We put things first into space. And then we start interpreting them in, in a progress of events. That's how at least we begin the process. Now we do much more than that, but we cannot do less than that. We have to do at least that much right off the bat. What we are dealing with in a word is phenomena. That's the word Kant uses. We're dealing with phenomena. Phenomena is not in this sense spectacular like fireworks, oh it was phenomenal, you know. But it just means experience, and it's this, this great, wonderful, strange experience of all of these sounds, sights, whirring noises, and other things. Now, if you're dealing with an infant, I've talked about this before, I'm just reminding you of it. If you're dealing with an infant, you try to help the infant along the way. So if you're trying to communicate with the infant, you get up about one inch from its nose and go, you know, you do all kinds of things to try to get the infant to notice you. Because one of the most frustrating things about an infant is they will tend not to notice you. You're right there and they're kind of looking off here like they don't know you're the important thing. They think maybe that little light bulb over there is what really matters. They don't know. And so you have to try to help them. No, I'm the important one here. You know, and maybe the infant will start paying attention to you, maybe not. It's sort of the way I feel when I'm lecturing in philosophy. I'm the important thing here. You got me. I'm on the one because I see students looking off out the window. Oh, look, there's a sparrow flying. You know. Please, I'm the one that's supposed to be the center of your concern right at the moment. You know. Well, we do that, and gradually we get it. Gradually, we start picking up a clue that in, our, in these 10,000 experiences of sensory stimulation, some things are more important than others. And we fix on those and suppress, or at least ignore, the others. There's all kinds of sounds that are reaching you right now. I think I'm probably the most noisy of them. But there's the whirring sound in the back of the room. There's lockers doors, voices, all kinds of things going on, you know. And for the most part, you're ignoring it. <laughs> well, I say for the most part. <laughs> you know, at least my hope, my wish is that you're ignoring it, and you're paying fundamentally attention to me. So that's this process of, of sort of sifting out and interpreting our experience. Well, what Kant means by percepts are these raw sensory experiences. Don't, in, don't think of them in space, don't think of them in time, just think of them as the most basic stimuli, lights, colors, sounds, feelings, smells, all of that just coming all at once, impinging on your senses, crowding into your consciousness with no particular interpretive meaning to them at all.
and it's up to you to make sense out of them. Per sense. Now for Kant, the percepts are coming. I'm, I'm giving you this in advance, so just make a little marginal note because we're going to come back to it. The percepts are coming from somewhere. He grants that. But we don't know much about where they're coming from. And so he calls them by a word that means mystery. The word he uses is noumena. But think question mark. It's coming from somewhere. But our first experience of these things is when they come pouring in like so much stuff in a butcher shop into the nozzles. That's when we start having to deal with it. And we really don't know what's out here. Big question mark. What's out here? Don't know. Cannot get there from here. Mystery. But we know something is tickling our nozzles and making us aware of sensation. That's where we begin to play the game. All right. Next term, concepts. Concepts refer to something happening in your mind. And this goes back to my discussion yesterday of the country kitchen. So you want to <coughs> incorporate the country kitchen <coughs> metaphor into our current discussion. Concepts refer to what he calls the innate categorical sorting machine. The innate <coughs> Categorical sorting machine. Each of those words is important. Ben, its innateness would would highlight what aspect of this? What does it mean to say it's innate? Well, it's inherent in us. Okay. Literally, innate means once again. What's the basic meaning of the word innate, Stephen? It means innate means. <coughs> the most basic meaning. Yeah, inside, but that's not quite it. Okay, get this, please. I mentioned it the other day. Get it in your notes. I want you to know this. I want you to have this. Innate means it was in you at birth. In nativity is the idea. At your birth. Innate. You bring it with you. This is why Kant is not an empiricist. Because he thinks we bring something to the table. But he's not a pure rationalist. Because he thinks there'd be nothing for us to do were it not for the percepts, which are empirical in character. You follow that? He's trying to synthesize. He's trying to give a fair hearing to both sides. So it's innate, it's categorical. I mentioned to you the other day that the 12 jars in the country kitchen all have different shapes and sizes and we can put the same thing into different jars or different things into, but we don't have the same jars, but you get the idea. There's, a, there's these categories in the mind. The percepts in and of themselves, the percepts now, are not knowable. What can be known is the consequence of putting a percept into a concept. <clears throat> so the percept flows in, and just like a coin in one of those coin machines that sips them out, it begins putting all of these percepts into various little jars, which are the categories of the mind. And it's from that sorting process percepts being sorted into categories that we get knowledge. Knowledge is the result of sorting percepts. As I mentioned to you, there are 12 categories. 
this is more detail than you need for this class. But any of you who expect to study philosophy in college, which I hope all, many of you hopefully will, and then you will be so grateful for the little heads up I gave you today. So uh, I can just promise you that. You know. uh, so anyway, I'm going to give you more detail than I will expect from you on any exam. I'm not going to ask for this back. But for you who are wanting to kind of get yourself geared up for you know, further philosophical studies, it'll at least give you something to think about. There are 12 categories, and I want to give them to you with brief explanation. So this is like a footnote, kind of an extended footnote to our discussion of the meat grinder. <clears throat> there are 12 categories in four classes, four classes of categories. The four classes are, I'll give these to you first, quantity, quality, relation, modality. Four, uh, four classes, quantity, quality, relation, modality. The quantity ones are the easiest to get. There are three of them. Three categories in the class of quantity. They are unity, plurality, totality. Unity is a category. You can put percepts into a category by which you interpret an experience as being unified, one thing. There is one Spencer. I put that, at least in some sense, the percept of my experience of that thing over there that I call Spencer into a class of one. There's one of him. And each of you would be similarly put into a class of one. That's an interpretation of an experience. There is plurality. I look in this room and I see a number of critters. I call them human beings. More particularly, I call them students. I notice there's more than one. It's sort of at this point an indeterminate number. I haven't gone through and counted, but I have a notion of plurality. There are several of these. That's a way of categorizing these percepts. There is totality. I have a notion of a whole number. All of the things within a given set of whatever the item is. Kind of gets to set theory. By the way, do you ever do set theory in mathematics? Does that ever come up? It was very popular a few years ago. And it, it has its roots in Kant, really, in this uh, kind of theory of numbers that you get from him. All right, so that's quantity. It's easy enough, really. Question? No. Yes? <coughs> Totality? Yes. What's... So if plurality is many students, totality would be? All the students. In a sense that I could say, it, like this, I could say, um, are all the philosophy students here today? They're not. So I can make a distinction between this partial group and the whole group. I have a notion of completion, totality, everything, everybody in a given class. It's like asking, you know, can we get all the dogs in the world together? Well, I have an idea in my head of all the dogs in the world. I, I can think about totality in that sense. I would not want to do that. All right. <clears throat> Secondly, quality. Again, three of these. Reality, negation, limitation. Reality, negation, limitation. This is a little harder. And again, I don't, I'm just trying to give you a kind of a sense of this without spending, you know, there are whole courses literally on these topics in a philosophy major. So um, <clears throat> this is uh, more than 
uh, you need to worry about, but just the basic idea. Reality, I can evaluate something as to whether it is real or not, you know, whether it is in fact reality. I can also contemplate the opposite of reality, which is non-reality or negation. I can look at Spencer and say he is real. I can imagine him not being there. I can think of the alternative. I can think of his non-being. Or I can imagine, who's not here today? Who's, who's uh, missing? Sydney. Sydney, yeah. So I've got a notion of a reality that I can negate, you know? I can imagine this one who is not here. For me right now, she's not real. <clears throat> we hope she's real for somebody somewhere, but for us right now, she's not. Limitation. <clears throat> That's the idea of I can distinguish between that which is real and other things. I can limit Spencer from other items in this room. I can say Spencer is not Megan. I can limit this one thing that I'm calling real. So that's, it's like the boundaries principle. Relation, third class. Substance and accidents. Causality and dependence. Community and interaction. Once again, these are, th these are three sets. You got it? Three sets that stand in a relation to each other. So relation can come in three flavors. One, substance and accidents. Second, causality and dependence. Third, community and interaction. My mind does this to the percepts. Just as Hume would say, I don't know if that's the way the external world really works. All I know is this is the way my mind understands the experiences that happen. Substance and accidents, basically the same distinction that we found in what earlier philosopher? Who made that distinction long before Kant? It was Spencer? Wasn't that Aquinas? Uh, well, before Aquinas, he makes the same distinction, but before him, it was who? Megan? Aristotle. Aristotle. Aristotle's the first one to really work that out. Substance, accidents, yes. <coughs> I'm just wondering, so if you have a precept, does it go into... A percept. Percept. Mm -hmm. Does it go into multiple categories? It can. Yes, it can. In fact, I would say it virtually always does. Because you have to think about... <clears throat> I know this is difficult. If I, if I think about what I'm seeing kind of in your end of the room here, all right, <clears throat> what I'm, if, if you take away space, I'm just seeing kind of a panorama of some shapes, colors, sizes, and they all are sort of, you know, coming like this. And, and now I immediately look and I say, oh, Stephen. But before I can say Stephen, there's kind of this color of your hair, there's sort of a shape of a face, there's ears, there's nose, you know, oh, there's a tie and all that. It's kind of coming at me. And so I'm putting you in a variety of, of, of uh, categories here. I'm putting you in a variety of categories, including your unity. You are not the person sitting next to you uh, and your relation to them. And, you know, so it, I would imagine that Kant would say, in some sense, we put a little bit of this percept in all of the categories all the time. And that's how we make sense out of our experience. <clears throat> All right, so substance accidents. <clears throat> Megan, you're the one who reminded us of uh, the original architect of such a distinction. What did uh, Aristotle have in mind when he made that distinction? Do you remember? Well, I always think back to how the Catholics explain communion. Yes. And so they say that when you're eating the body, or the bread and wine, you're eating the actual body and blood, and that's mm -hmm. the accidents, I believe. Mm, it's just the opposite. You're, you're eating the substance of the body and blood. The accidents stay the same. Right. So 
So is that what you were trying to say? Or worse yeah. saying? Well, I, I got a switch. So. Okay, yeah, that's the idea. Y'all remember that, don't you? So Aristotle's distinction is that the substance is what's actually there. The accident is what appears to be. In the breadiness of the bread, if you will. The whininess of the wine, you know. <clears throat> and so on. So we make that distinction, and he says that's a classification in the mind. Notice the implication of that. Both substance and accidents are, are in our minds. For Aristotle, they are in the object. We're, we're distinguishing the substance, what's actually there, from the accidents, my experience of it. Kant says my experience of it includes both. You follow that? So it's all going inside. This is, again, the Copernican revolution. It's all in here. Second one, causality and dependence. Let's see, that's... This is Kant following Hume. Because I think that causality is part of the operation of the universe. I think that things cause other things and some things depend on other things. But what Kant is arguing is that that very idea of dependence, of causality, of one thing producing another is an interpretive mechanism in my mind. And this is why Kant though awakened from his dogmatic slumbers by Hume, nevertheless follows Hume in Hume's criticism of classical theistic proofs. So Kant, in some ways, is as vicious in his attack on something like the cosmological argument as Hume was. Even though Kant not only calls himself a theist, he calls himself a Christian. He believes he's a good Christian. Pietist, if you know what that term means, but he considers himself a Christian and a defender of Christianity. Okay. But Aquinas has to go, the argument from motion has to go, the argument from design has to go, the argument from gradation of reality has to go, all of that stuff has to go because all of it depends on categories of the mind and if that's all it is, then we have no idea if that's what the external universe is actually all about. And if it's not part of the external universe, then there's no way to reason to external, you know, sort of objective conclusions like God is. You tracking with me here? You following that? You sort of? Do I need to run by, th you know? You look at me like, you. oh, that's very profound. Mr. You know? This is good stuff, you know? I want you to get this. I, you get caught. You understand the world today, because we are living in a Kantian world. All right, so you follow that. Basically, Kant agrees with Hume that the theistic proofs do not work because he agrees that causation itself is not part of the external world, at least we don't know that it is, it's only part of our internal interpretation of raw percepts. It's the way we explain these percepts that are flowing in, and we mistakenly assume that because we interpret it this way in here, it must be the way things are out there. There's no way to know that. So does he say, uh, I'm, a little, I'm still a little confused, so does he say that if you use the example of the pen dropping, yeah. um, would he say that the pen hitting the table there wasn't actually, or we just, we just thought yeah. that it was a cause? First of all, we don't know if there is a pen and we don't know if there's a table. We don't know if, if uh, the sound you hear has any connection to those whatsoever. Those are just raw percepts flowing in in a kind of random collage of experience. Okay. But your brain goes to work on that experience and begins to interpret this coincidence of drop, pen, hear, sound as causation. Okay. But, the, but the interpretation of it is purely intuitive, it is purely internal. So he doesn't believe in anything like that we, we know that there's actually a table here? He says we don't know. He says it's noumena, it's mystery. Oh. 
It's in a mystery place. He assumes there's something out there. All right, that's important. He does not believe in kind of like I think it's solipsism. You know that term where you are the only reality that is. He believes there's a noumenal order, but he simply says we have no clue what it actually is. All we have a clue about is these percepts flowing in and what we do with them. So the chief focus of our study should be what's going on in here, and we should despair of what's going on out there. We can't know it anyway, so why try? It's the listen to me, it is the death of metaphysics. Okay. Metaphysics has always been concerned with, in Kant's terms, what's upstairs. What is out there? That's metaphysics, by definition. Metaphysics in the modern world is dead. Do you understand that? You go down to Barnes & Noble, you walk in, you say, hmm, I think I'll take a look at the section on metaphysics. They have one. What do you find? If you go and look at the section on metaphysics at Barnes & Noble, what kind of books do you find? Do you know? Honey? You find books on superstition. You find books on the occult. You find books on New Age. You find books on mysticism. You find books on irrationality, you see. You don't find books on traditional metaphysics. It's dead. Kant killed it. Put a tombstone over it. And the modern age is an age that despairs of objective reality, metaphysical truth, and says the only thing you can know about it is what you might learn in a seance. You know, or looking into a crystal ball or a Ouija board. I mean, that's where you're going to get in touch with metaphysics. Right. Please, Jacob. I don't know if you're going to talk about this, but um, how does he reconcile that with his Christian. <laughs> That's right. uh, yes, I am going to talk about that, Jacob. It's an extraordinarily astute question. And if I can just, I'm going to hazard to say something here, which I will in fact explain a little bit more later. Kant is probably the most robust presuppositional apologist in the history of the church until Bart. Okay. And that's how he reconciles it. Now, I'm going to save further discussion, so that's a very cryptic answer, but I think you may catch the point. But in any event, I'll, we'll come back to it later. Yes? You may, you may also come back to this later, but what, what is, if there's no, if we can't know what is really real, what's real or anything like that, what's the point in us doing good? Mm. And what's the point in us, what's the point in me not killing Spencer? Yeah. Well, he does have an ethic. He has his category. Well, that's true. But he says you still have to live with the world in here. And in the world in here, you do have conscience. You do have self-interest. And in fact, you have some idea that if you kill someone, it's less in your interest than if you treat him with virtue, even though, in fact, you have no clue whether there is a Spencer and whether anything you do for him is actually you know, benefiting him. But he wants to find in his categorical imperative some justification for good conscience and a, um, a you know, a, a solid ethic uh, that will guide your behavior. We will come back to that a little bit later. Yeah. All right, well, as you will see, we have not quite made it through the meat grinder, and we still have three more easy lessons, so a little bit more to cover here. Uh, probably safe to say we're looking at Wednesday. You know. All right, you are dismissed.